Hello to everyone and welcome to this workshop about central banks and uh, climate change. It is a part of our next generation of central banking conference. I'm Wojtek Kalinowski and I'm the co-director of the Veblen Institute for Economic Reforms, which is a think tank based in Paris and focused on uh, ecological transition issues. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator today for our to today's discussion. We only have one hour for this workshop and we have lots of ideas to, to, to present. So I will uh, stick to a very short introduction of our session and then I'll introduce our three speakers. Um, and then I ask them to uh, first a very short, brief uh, introductory note of some five to seven minutes. And then I hope that we'll have uh, uh, lots of questions uh, as you might know already, there is a chat window that you can use to uh, ask questions and also to vote for questions that you find uh, particularly interesting. I don't guarantee that we can answer all the questions, but I do my best uh, and in the limits of time. And we will, uh, we will try to end that session at, uh, in one hour from now. Um, so uh, I hope that we'll have at least 20 minutes for the discussion. Uh, so as for the introduction, well, it will be very, very short. I think that you're very aware of the fact that the, the role of central banks and of monetary policy has been a huge issue the last years, both in Europe and elsewhere, but it's particularly in Europe, I think. And uh, um, the, central, the European Central Bank is in the midst of the, its strategic review pro revision process. And that as part of that process, it, it will also define the strategy to address uh, what they call environmental sustainability. So I gather that climate change is, is part of that issue, but maybe the sustainability will be defined broader, including both biodiversity issues and others. Uh, anyhow, uh, both Christine Lagarde and other representatives from the ECB have signaled quite clearly that they are taking this issue of climate change and the sustainability very seriously and uh, uh, that they will do something, but we're still waiting for, for the concrete re responses. And given that this context, um, and given the limited amount of time we, hear, we have here, what I suggest is that we don't spend time on explaining once more uh, you know, the climate crisis and uh, why the central banks should ask, should uh, do something. We ask them to, to to, to act, and we are still waiting for concrete proposals. So rather, I would uh, suggest that we spend our, our, our time uh, on discussing the policy options. So concretely, what could the central banks do to contribute to fighting climate change and contribute to put you know, our economic model into a path of uh, the social and ecological transition? Um, and uh, with us to discuss this, we have today three speakers, and I present them very, very, very briefly in order of appearance. So first, we'll hear Maria Nicolaidi, and Maria is associate professor in economics at the University of Greenwich and a fellow at the Forum for Macroeconomics and Microeconomics Policies. And her research includes financial fragility, macroeconomics and banking regulation and also ecological macroeconomics. And she recently authored a paper about the greening of the QE, of the quantitative easing, and the particular of the, about the corporate asset purchase programs. And uh, that paper is available in, in, will be available for, for you in a moment. And I think that Maria will uh, draw upon that paper in her, in her uh, introductory uh, talk. And then we'll hear Renz van Tilburg, who is the director of the Sustainability Finance Lab, which is an academic think tank based in at Utrecht University in Netherlands. And Renz works extensively on climate and uh, financial risks and monetary policy since 2014 already. And uh, he wrote a series of papers about this, but one of them, the recent ones is about credit guidance and the role of uh, Mm, credit guidance by the central banks in order to steer the transition in the right direction. And I think that is uh, uh, what Renz will talk about in a moment. 
And then finally, finally, we have Jezebel coupé soubran who is an associate professor at the Paris Sorbonne University in Paris. But uh, Jezebel is also a colleague of mine She's, uh, here at the Veblen Institute. She, she uh, wrote uh, recently a paper about uh, about uh, the same subject uh, with a, a slightly different focus uh, since uh, Jezebel is uh, pleading for a monetization of the ecological investments. And I think that is the topic that will uh, that Jezebel will speak about um, in a moment. So uh, thank you once more for coming to our workshop. I hope the discussion will be uh, interesting for you and don't, uh, don't forget to, uh, to give our your comments or ask our questions uh, using the chat window. Uh, so Maria, uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll give you the floor for some five to 10 minutes, Max. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully you can see uh, the slides that I have uh, in front of me. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to uh, thank you for the uh, introduction uh, and uh, for the invitation to be part of uh, a panel uh, that have the opportunity to talk about uh, greening uh, the monetary policies. Uh, so, in my talk, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on some of the findings of uh, the report that uh, we uh, published with uh, Yanis Tafermos, Daniela Gabor, Adam Pavlov, and uh, Frank Van Lerden. Um, uh, in particular, I will uh, show you that uh, there is a carbon bias uh, in uh, the uh, corporate QE program of the ECB. And uh, then I'll uh, suggest two alternative uh, scenarios in order to uh, decarbonize uh, these uh, QE programs. So um, we uh, wanted to analyze, uh, we want to investigate if there is a carbon bias in uh, this uh, corporate QE program. In order to do that, uh, we uh, identify uh, the bonds that are issued by carbon intensity sectors. If you have a look at uh, the slides, uh, at the figure that I have on the slide, you can see uh, that 62.7% of uh, the value uh, of uh, the bonds are issued by carbon intensive uh, sectors. Uh, this uh, proportion is uh, much higher uh, than the gross value added in the euro area of uh, these uh, sectors which is actually 29.1%. Uh, so there is an over-representation uh, of uh, these uh, carbon intensive sectors in the uh, corporate uh, QE uh, program. Um, so based uh, on uh, this, uh, we argue that uh, there is a, a carbon uh, bias uh, in uh, the QE. Um, uh, then um, before I explain the sources of uh, this uh, carbon bias, I would like briefly to talk a bit about uh, the ways in which the ECB actually identifies uh, the uh, bonds that uh, they uh, purchase. So uh, first, uh, the uh, ECB looks into uh, the uh, universe of bonds uh, that are issued by non-banks, and uh, these uh, bonds are denominated in the uh, euro. Uh, and then uh, they um, apply uh, the uh, so-called eligibility criteria that actually have to do, uh, among others, with the investment grade of uh, these uh, bonds. Uh, when they have done uh, this uh, process, uh, they establish what we call the universe of eligible bonds, and uh, the ECB buys only a proportion uh, of uh, these bonds. And in order for the ECB to choose uh, these uh, bonds, uh, they apply uh, the so-called market neutrality uh, principle. Uh, just to give an example about this uh, market neutrality uh, principle, for those of you uh, who uh, are not aware, um, if uh, the um, uh, companies, uh, the uh, food companies, uh, correspond to 5% of uh, the uh, total value of uh, bonds, uh, then uh, they need to correspond at 5% out of the uh, purchases uh, of uh, the ECB. So in this way, uh, the uh, ECB uh, wants to avoid the distortions in the uh, financial market. Uh, but since we want to investigate this uh, source of uh, the carbon bias that I mentioned before, uh, we uh, replicate uh, this uh, process and we do that by using data uh, from uh, Thomson Reuters. And we, uh, we apply gradually all of the eligibility uh, criteria that the ECB sets. 
Uh, and uh, we find that there are almost 3,000 bonds that are uh, considered eligible. And the ECB buys only uh, some of these uh, bonds, or almost a half of them. So I said that we want to understand this source of uh, the carbon bias uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. In order to do that, we construct a table uh, that you can see on the slide. Uh, so uh, this uh, first uh, column uh, shows the bonds uh, that are issued by uh, non-banks and are uh, denominated in euro. And you can see that 45.5% uh, uh, out of uh, these bonds are issued by carbon intensive sectors. When we apply the other eligibility criteria, the uh, eligibility criteria of the ECB, which has to do with uh, uh, the uh, companies need to have a domicile in the euro area, they need to have a specific maturity and they need to be investment grade, you can see uh, that there is a gradual increase uh, in uh, this uh, proportion uh, of bonds that are issued by uh, carbon intensive uh, sectors. Uh, but uh, when we also apply the market neutrality uh, principle, this proportion becomes even higher, close to this 62.7% that I, I mentioned before. So overall, we can see that there is a carbon bias in the universe of bonds, but when we apply this uh, so-called eligibility criteria, the carbon bias uh, becomes uh, more uh, important. So uh, we want actually to uh, have a scenario to have a QE program in which we don't have uh, this uh, carbon bias. Uh, and uh, so we suggest two alternative uh, scenarios uh, that are uh, more uh, environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, have these two alternative scenarios, we need to abandon uh, the market neutrality principle. In both of these uh, scenarios that I'm going to explain, uh, we uh, exclude assets that are issued by carbon intensive sectors, and then we replace them uh, with uh, assets, let's say, with bonds uh, that are uh, more environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, in order to identify these environmentally friendly bonds, uh, we uh, rely uh, on uh, the bonds that are labeled as a green bonds, and we also include uh, bonds uh, that are uh, considered as potentially green, taking into account uh, the EU uh, taxonomy. So um, in this uh, bar, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the amount of bonds uh, that the ECB has, uh, and you can see that most of them are uh, carbon intensive uh, bonds, uh, but there are some uh, of them that are considered uh, environmentally friendly, but there are not uh, so many. So this is why we construct these uh, two alternative uh, scenarios. The first one is what we call uh, the lower uh, carbon scenario. Uh, in this scenario, we exclude uh, bonds that are issued by positive companies. And uh, we also exclude uh, bonds uh, that, are the other, that have to do with the other uh, carbon intensive companies and have uh, a relatively uh, high uh, emission intensity. Uh, and as I said, we replace them uh, with other bonds uh, that are environmentally uh, friendly. Um, two points on this. Uh, first, if a bond is issued by a carbon intensive uh, company, it can remain in our scenario if they issue a green bond or if they have a relatively low emission uh, intensity. Uh, the second point that I would like to make is that uh, overall we want to keep the same outstanding amount uh, as uh, the ECB has. Uh, so uh, we take this uh, into account in, into our analysis. Um, but uh, someone could say that this uh, is, uh, has uh, some assets that, uh, that are uh, dirty. So this is why we uh, construct another scenario that we call the low carbon lease scenario. And in this scenario, we exclude all the carbon intensive uh, bonds. Uh, and we replace them with other bonds that are environmentally friendly, but in order to keep the same amount uh, of uh, bonds as in the ECB, uh, we need to relax one of uh, the eligibility criteria, and actually we relax the investment criteria. So these are the two uh, scenarios that we suggest to decarbonize uh, the uh, ECB program. And uh, uh, these uh, two scenarios actually illustrate that as long as uh, the um, as long as the uh, ECB uh, abandons the uh, market neutrality uh, principle, uh, they will have some options in order to decarbonize uh, their QE uh, program. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, there are uh, some, um, this is an ongoing uh, work uh, that we have, and uh, which actually is uh, funded uh, by the uh, INSPIRE uh, project. So we are investigating some alternative uh, scenarios, and actually we're interested in having a more granular approach in order to define greenness and deathness. And also we are uh, want to uh, show uh, what would be the impact of these uh, decarbonized scenarios on the carbon emissions. Uh, we, uh, prepare, uh, we will prepare another uh, report uh, that will be uh, published in uh, March. Uh, and uh, this report will has to do with another aspect of uh, monetary policy has to do with the green uh, collateral uh, framework. Um, and of course, all these uh, monetary policies uh, need to be in line uh, with the two uh, degrees uh, target of uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, point out that uh, fiscal policies need to have an important role since they have a direct effect in decarbonizing uh, the economy. So uh, many thanks. I uh, hope uh, I didn't uh, spend a lot of uh, your time. So uh, that's uh, from my side. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Th thank you. On the contrary, well, Maria, uh, you you introduced the, the the market neutrality principle. Well, I don't know if uh, all in the people in the audience are familiar with that concept, but there is basically it's the idea that monetary policy should not have uh, consequences, should not change the economical structure, should not pick winners and losers, as as, as they say in the jargon of central bankers. Uh, and which is which is quite the opposite of the very idea of transforming the economy into the transition is about transforming the economical uh, tissue of, of of you know of of, uh, of production and uh, and all this all the all that stuff and uh, so so the, this is the main doctrine of the central banking since the 80s and it is uh, at the heart of 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 the whole debate i think and uh, it it has been sort of uh, uh, discussed even within central banks more and more openly in the recent months, actually. Uh, so it's a positive sign. And we will come back to the two with the already a question for you, uh, but but we will uh, I will straight away give uh, give uh, uh, the stage to Renz, who will speak about another kind of instrument. Here we are, we were talking about buying what 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 the central banks actually are buying. Uh, in their uh, asset purchase programs, but uh, uh, central banks also determine credit rates. And uh, Rens, I think that he will uh, speak about how to guide uh, credit, use the credit guidance as a tool to, to direct uh, finance into the right direction. So Rens, the floor is yours and please be as disciplined as Maria was. Yes, thank you, Wojtek. I will, uh, I will try. Um, and uh, actually, I don't think it, 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 credit guidance is, is I think, uh, is also an important instrument, uh, especially used in, in history. Uh, I think what I will be talking about is a bit more specific, uh, even though you can say it is amongst the, 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 the instruments you can call credit uh, guidance. Um, it's laid down in a report uh, called Targeting the Green Recovery that uh, we published uh, at the end of last year together with uh, Positive Money uh, Europe. Um, I wrote it together with Jens van Klooster, who was in a uh, previous uh, session, um, and he uh, called uh, the tool that I will uh, talk about uh, the, the, actually the most powerful tool of, uh, of the ECB. Um, I myself have uh, called it in the, the press release then uh, the, the big bazooka that no one has ever heard of, um, which in a sense may be because nobody uh, really knows how to pronounce it, because uh, I always hear different uh, ways how, how it's pronounced. It's either the the TELTO, TELTRO, or the TLTRO, um, but at least it's uh, uh, what it means is the targeted long-term refinancing operations. Um, and it's an instrument of the ECB uh, not very well known, and is also in that sense uh, not so much uh, talked about as about the, the asset purchases. Um, but, uh, well, we think uh, it, uh, it, it deserves more, uh, more attention. And essentially what it does is uh, that the ECB provides cheap funding uh, for banks in order to incentivize them to keep the lending to the real economy um, at least um, uh, at the level where it, uh, where it is. Um, and it is uh, last year, uh, it was not, uh, not even that big, uh, but this year it has really, really grown. Uh, so it stands currently at uh, 1.7 1, 1. trillion. Uh, which is in, in the, the same order of magnitude as the, uh, the asset purchase program of, uh, of this year. But what you need to keep in mind is that these asset purchases 
um, are uh, to the for, for for the majority uh, they concern um, uh, sovereign bonds um, and uh, about 250 of those uh, billion of uh, of the asset purchases are uh, have to do with uh, companies um, and on the other hand uh, these teltros they are totally focused on uh, on real economy lending so to lending to uh, companies and uh, and households um, and what's also important uh, whereas the asset purchases um, are only uh, of relevance for the big corporations who uh, issue bonds uh, this as it's working through the banks um, is an instrument which also uh, uh, brings uh, finance to the SMEs, uh, the small companies, and, uh, and to the households, uh, even though the mortgages are, uh, are excluded. So it's, it's, it's an instrument which, especially for Europe, which is very strongly bank-based, um, is very, uh, very important. And we came to think about it, so a little bit about the context, uh, when we wrote uh, this report, the new unconventional, I'll just uh, make a little bit of publicity for that, uh, which was uh, out uh, early uh, last year, um, which did not start from a green or sustainability perspective, but actually from an analysis of where the Eurozone uh, was at, uh, at that time. Uh, was al so already before uh, the Corona crisis, uh, we were worried about the stagnation and the divergence uh, in, uh, in the Eurozone. Um, and we looked at the kind of like the fiscal and monetary instruments available. Uh, and we concluded that um, uh, would there be a next crisis uh, that we, we, we would need monetary instruments that were more directly uh, 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 targeting the real economy. Um, so uh, again, away from these, uh, this focus on, on, on the asset purchases. So we came up with essentially two uh, um, suggestions. So the one was more fiscal monetary coordination, the kind of like coordination that we've actually seen uh, through the European Commission's uh, common lending for, uh, for the recovery fund. And I think Jezebel will uh, tell more about that uh, after me. Um, and the other one was that we said this Teltro uh, instrument, which was already uh, being used, uh, could be used much more ambitiously. Um, and actually also, I will go into that more late, uh, uh, later, uh, much more targeted, because at the, at the moment, it's not really that ambitious. So you get your uh, uh, cheap funding as a bank if, if you only keep your lending uh, at the same level. So it doesn't really, in that sense, uh, uh, um, induce too much of the new lending. Now, what we also do say, and that's where sustainability comes in, is that if you as a central bank uh, become this more dominant factor in the economy, as the ECB has done, but uh, uh, with these new instruments like the Teltro this year uh, uh, has increasingly done, uh, you also need to uh, take responsibility and think of what are the, uh, the consequences of these instruments in uh, the real economy. Because you, you, you become as a central bank a steering force um, and um, that's where sustainability comes in, um, in the first instance, in, uh, from, from the risk perspective, uh, because you induce banks to take on extra lending. Um, and if you do that in the wrong direction, uh, you, you do that in, in non-sustainable loans, uh, then uh, the transition risks for the, for the banks, they will, uh, will increase and you have a, well, a financial stability issue. Um, but you also have a, a political issue, um, and that's where the secondary objectives uh, come in, something that central bankers and even politicians don't really uh, like to talk about too much, but I think they're very important, given that they are clearly in the, in the, uh, in the, in the EU treaties, um, and they say that the ECB needs to support also uh, the general economic policies like environmental objectives of the European Union, um, as long as it doesn't hurt price stability, and I think that's the third and also an uh, an, 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 um, a reason that is not being talked about enough, um, and that's the threat to price stability uh, that is actually coming uh, with, uh, with climate change. And we will have a, a paper out on that in the next uh, couple of, uh, of weeks. Now, um, uh, how does the Teltro uh, work? Um, it, 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 it's derived from a, a regular instrument, actually one of the, uh, the, the most important instruments of a central bank, which is the, the refinancing operation. So banks normally, they fund themselves with uh, issuing deposits, uh, borrowing money in the, in, in the money markets. But if they fail to do so, they can always fall back on the central bank um, and borrow the money for the ECB policy rate. Um, so in normal times, this is an instrument being, uh, being used. It's there. It's a sort of like a backstop for, uh, for, for the banks. Um, and if there's more stress in the system, banks will need to use this more often. Um, and that's where uh, so the, the main refinancing operations, the MRO, that's the, 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 the regular instrument. In times of stress, uh, the ECB has introduced the longer term refinancing operations, so the LTRO. Um, 
And in 2014, uh, they uh, added to that the, the first T, uh, the T of targeted. Uh, and the targeted me meant that the ECB is saying specifically, uh, uh, we target the real lending, uh, not the mortgage lending. Um, and only for that, you can get uh, cheap financing. Um, and, and as the stress uh, uh, increased in the system, what we see is that the ECB has increased uh, the, the amount of money that can be uh, loaned through, uh, through the, the Teltros, um, but also uh, the, the interest rate that they give on it. So uh, currently with the third Teltro this year, um, if you borrow from uh, the ECB, uh, you, you actually pay minus 1% uh, of interest on, uh, on that, which of course is very attractive. And that also explains why the banks in, uh, in, in Europe are so much uh, using this. However, they are using this in an environment in which the prices are not future proof, so to say, also because the government policies are not with respect to, for instance, climate, which means that you are, are, are currently enticing the banks to ramp up their lending in a unsustainable manner. Now, that's where uh, the, the, the idea of greening this instrument comes in. Um, and so what we proposed, uh, me and Jens van Klooster, is that uh, you would only get this uh, interesting rate or even a more interesting rate if you could show that uh, uh, at least a larger part of, uh, of, of your lending is indeed uh, uh, going towards sustainable uh, lending. Uh, we can use the EU taxonomy for, uh, for that, um, but as you know, this is still uh, a work in progress. Um, so that's not something that you can use uh, at this very moment. Um, has, and that's why we proposed, um, and that's also an idea where, where we're uh, developing further now, is to start with uh, uh, lending to very specific sectors, um, like, for instance, real estate, uh, where all over Europe, a lot of uh, lending needs to, uh, to take place um, um, in order to make uh, houses more energy efficient and commercial buildings. And, and, and what you can do as an ECB is say, like, okay, for that specific lending, we give even a more favorable interest rate and that way you would stimulate the real economy and you would do it in a very sustainable way and it would also be possible to do because it's a rather uh, clear target and there's all kinds of institutions in the different countries who can uh, uh, give the, the certification that banks are actually uh, lending the money for for this particular reason um, and well that's the uh, the idea thank you thank you thank you Rens. so uh, yes you're right about the the the, the historical uh, credit guidance was uh, much more directive. It was uh, central banks uh, here in France, which has been practiced uh, in the 60s and 70s, when the central bank actually said to private banks, you give uh, to that company for that uh, interest rate alone. Where, whereas uh, in the modern term, this doesn't exist. So in the modern term, what we have is the refinancing conditions. So the idea is that you still uh, guide the credit through the refinancing operations. So in, in, it's a way of indirectly guide the credit. The question is, of course, is, do you guide them uh, far enough? Um, but anyway, so, so we, we, here we have a two, two kind of instruments trying to change the financing conditions, whereas Jezebel, uh, who will take the stage now, will go a bit farther in, in, the, in the proposals and actually suggest that central banks should uh, commit to direct uh, financing of the transition. Jezebel, uh, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wojtek. Uh, happy to discuss uh, with all of you about how central banks, uh, especially the European Central Bank, uh, could tackle climate change. Uh, I hope, uh, probably like most of you, that uh, the next generation of uh, uh, central bankers uh, will be green. So, um, this short presentation uh, draws on my uh, recent um, Veblen policy note, uh, which is one of the two papers uh, we published in a dossier uh, entitled the UCB uh, at the time for decision. Uh, basically, uh, the first paper claims uh, that the answers offered by central banks until now are insufficient uh, to, to deal with the problem of climate change. And uh, in the second one, I, I show that there is a, a fairly range, uh, a fairly wide range of options available uh, for greening monetary policy of the ECB. Um, time is short, I know. Uh, so I will just address two questions. Uh, the first one is environmental sustainability 
in or, or uh, out uh, the ECB's uh, mandate will be quickly answered. And the second one about uh, uh, available options for greening monetary policy may be more discussed uh, and will occupy me a little longer. Concerning my first point, uh, contrary to what is sometimes heard uh, inside and outside the ECB, even if uh, the discourse is uh, changing, I believe environmental sustainability is already part uh, of the ECB's mandate. The reason is that uh, the European Union has set itself a goal of uh, climate neutrality uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, according to the well-known Article 127, uh, the Euro system has to contribute uh, to the objectives of the Union. So I would claim that uh, the ECB is not fulfilling its mandate if it does not commit itself more openly and beyond the rhetoric uh, to climate risk mitigation. Having, uh, having said that, uh, what are the policy options? So, um, in my opinion, we need to go beyond proposals such as uh, Green QE or green TLTR rules. Uh, this option has been presented previously by Maria uh, and, uh, and Renz. And uh, um, these are what I would call light green options. Uh, they consist in greening the condition uh, for access to liquidity and uh, uh, asset purchase uh, by the ECB. Um, these options are necessary, uh, but uh, we need also a bright green uh, option. Uh, we need both types of uh, options because they are complementary. Let me briefly explain. Uh, light green options are feasible uh, within the current institutional framework or without significant change of governance. It's an advantage. Uh, they will be useful for, redu for reducing the, the proportion of green assets uh, on the balance sheets uh, of commercial banks uh, and central banks and in collateral. Uh, it's another advantage. But they will not allow to accelerate uh, the transition as much as we need to uh, in order to achieve uh, climate and environmental objectives. It's because uh, they will act upon financing, financing conditions but will not finance directly the transition. Uh, they do not directly involve the central bank uh, in financing the transition. None of this uh, uh, light green option uh, will fund uh, the transition. At best, uh, a green QE of uh, public debt uh, issued by uh, governments to finance investment defined in the Green uh, New Deal uh, will facilitate uh, the funding of the transition, but will not finance it directly. That's why uh, I will have, I will add a, a bright green uh, a bright green option, uh, which will uh, contribute directly to funding as uh, the ecological transition. Uh, it will enable the funding uh, of the ecological uh, transition by the central bank in a very interesting way because it does not fuel debt and it will safeguard uh, financial uh, stability. This option is uh, that of monetization. Uh, in monetization, um, in the strict sense of the term, understood as a transfer of central money to the treasuries without interest and not refundable uh, to finance well-defined uh, climate investments. This option, of course, uh, would require uh, the most institutional change uh, but it's also arguably the one that will most advance uh, the ecological transition, precisely uh, because it will help uh, finance investments that are essential uh, to the ecological transition and that the market uh, will never agree to finance. Um, let me take an example uh, to, to give a, an intuition of the merits of monetization. Think about transportation. This sector is the largest contributor to carbon emissions. Um, 
uh, in, uh, uh, in France, it's uh, one third of total, uh, uh, of total carbon emissions. Um, to reduce emissions from this uh, sector, we will have to completely rethink the way railways operate. This will represent very heavy infrastructure investments. Uh, will it be possible to rely on private investment uh, when this investment uh, will be collectively very useful but uh, not very profitable? Um, probably not. Will it be based on public debt uh, when this debt um, will already have increased uh, significantly with the health crisis? Probably not. And it's precisely uh, when we are faced with investments that are indispensable uh, for the community, but uh, too unprofitable uh, for the market or too burdensome uh, for public finances that monetization uh, makes sense. With monetization, um, that means uh, transfer uh, of central money to the, to the treasuries without interest and uh, non-refundable, I repeat, uh, this type of uh, non-standard investment becomes uh, feasible because uh, it is financed. It would uh, obviously uh, not be a question uh, of financing all public investments in this way. In other words, uh, we need to think of monetization as a complementary source of uh, uh, financing for investments that are essential uh, to maintain the well-being of society, uh, even more so uh, if they are investments necessary uh, for its survival on the planet, uh, therefore as a priority for climate investments. If this option um, were to become possible, it would require uh, appropriate governance the key question is, of course, uh, who will decide uh, on uh, the eligibility of uh, expenditure for uh, central bank monetization? Uh, clearly, uh, the decision uh, will not be taken by the central bank, uh, since it is not an elected institution, and uh, this would far exceed its mandate. Uh, could states decide it for themselves? No, no more than the central banks. Uh, because uh, um, any action taken, taken uh, uh, will then uh, at, the, uh, at the direction of the executive power, uh, which will be uh, appropriating a sort of uh, a drawing right for categories investments uh, that it could deliver to other political purpose. It clearly means uh, that a new governance structure um, should be created and uh, include representatives of the Eurosystem member states, uh, the European Commission, parliaments, environmental uh, NGOs, and the, maybe to uh, the climate science uh, community. Uh, this, uh, uh, this new institutional structure uh, could be, for, for, for instance, uh, a European High Council for Climate uh, uh, Neutrality, uh, representing the long-term general in, in interest by uh, bringing together all stakeholders uh, and the opinion of which, uh, once validated by the, the European Parliament and uh, National Parliament, uh, will be binding on both uh, the budget and monetary policy, uh, while keeping monetary uh, outside of the executive uh, uh, direct control. Of course, uh, the statutes and uh, remit of an institution like this uh, will need to be defined uh, with the main uh, with the main requirements uh, being to guarantee the democratic nature of the decision and to prevent the risk of uh, uh, uncontrolled use of uh, uh, monetization uh, without doubt uh, this bright green option uh, will uh, be the most demanding institutionally uh, in the current state of the treaty uh, it's prohibited uh, and to find a way to this option, uh, you might have to go through to light green option first. Uh, however, uh, the prospect of uh, a treaty change uh, should no longer be a taboo subject. Uh, the treaty is no longer adapted to the health, env environmental and climate challenge of the 21st uh, 
uh, century. Uh, and between the preservation of the treaty and the, uh, that of life on Earth, uh, we will have to choose and do it uh, uh, quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jezebel, and now we have uh, some uh, 15, 18 minutes for, for, for the discussion. So what I will, I, what I suggest is to distribute to the three of you some, some of the uh, questions that already arrived uh, in the chat window and ask there is a question for everyone. And uh, that might, and then give you the, the possibility to react also to, 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 to what the other uh, speakers have said. Um, Maria, uh, there is a question for you about uh, why do you speak on, uh, only about uh, carbon assets? And uh, I gather this is a question about uh, how should we, uh, is there a metrics to, to, to measure uh, other environmental risks? And uh, at what stage could, be, could they be introduced into the you know, QE and other instruments? And the, there is, uh, there is a very practical question to you, Rens, about uh, uh, where does these uh, discussions uh, of remaking the TLTRs stand within the ECB, whether you have some knowledge about uh, this being incorporated into the strategic review, if, if we actually can hope for some concrete uh, applications of, this, of these policies. And then there are two, two questions uh, uh, about the monetization to Jezebel. The first one is about inflation. Should, uh, are we, do, do you see a risk for, for raising up the inflation with such a, such a policy of trillions? Well, you haven't mentioned the, the, the volumes, but still. And uh, there is a great question about, uh, about uh, bringing these monetization ideas with uh, funding uh, co local communities uh, through monetary inv innovations. This is actually another team that, uh, that Veblen Institute works on actually. So, so the Magdalena can contact us. Uh, we have some ideas about this, but I don't know if Jezebel can answer this, uh, the, this idea in, uh, in this context. So, uh, so, uh, so please uh, take uh, three, four minutes, each of you for, for this first round of questions. And then we'll see if we have some additional ones. Uh, maybe 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 we start with the with the, in the in the reverse order. So so mm -hmm. Isabel, Renz, and Maria, if you if you agree. Uh, okay. About uh, so uh, about the suite of uh, inflation uh, with uh, with monetization. Uh, I think the. The, the problem of the moment is not inflation; it is deflation. Uh, we uh, we need uh, we need inflation, and uh, we need uh, uh, many many uh, public investments uh, to accelerate uh, the, the ecological uh, the ecological transition. So um, uh, I think we um, uh, we have um, um, we have no need to switch inflation uh, for the uh, for, for the moment and um, it's uh, um, uh, it's uh, it's important to uh, to add uh, that uh, uh, this type of investments are necessary to uh, transform uh, the production to transform the the capacity of uh, the capacity of production uh, inflation uh, um, uh, generally uh, uh, arrives when you have a, a very big uh, disequilibrium uh, between uh, demand and offer. Uh, investment in, tra in ecological transition um, um, will be um, uh, investment in, uh, uh, in the direction of the, uh, of the offer. I, I don't know if it is uh, uh, if it is well said, but uh, it's uh, it's to transform uh, capacity of uh, uh, capacity of production. So um, uh, I think uh, with this type of investment, uh, we have we will have uh, no no many problem of in inflation. I don't. 
I don't hear you, Wojtek. Your, your microphone is, uh, is out. Sorry, we can switch to Renz then. Ah, yes. So I, I, I had uh, two questions, I think. Uh, so the one is, do central banks uh, consider uh, Telto seriously? Um, well, I, I, uh, in a sense, I do not know, uh, but I know that I, I have given presentations um, at the ECB and several uh, national central banks over the last couple of months. So they definitely uh, were eager to, uh, to engage on this um, and, 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 well, did look at, at it seriously. Uh, so we had very good, uh, good discussions on that. Um, but but well, well, we'll have to see. Um, I, I think uh, at this month, this month uh, at the ECB, they will, uh, will 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 see to draw their first conclusions in the strategy review. Um, so uh, and for me, that is a, a black box as well. Uh, the other question was: uh, uh, Doesn't the ECB become political in uh, in doing this? Um, and well, in in our paper, we uh, we extensively discuss uh, this. But to 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 shortly. Uh, add to that. Uh, so I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think actually, if you look at the treaty, uh, it quite clearly um, 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 mandates the ECB to, uh, to, to contribute to the general economic policies, including uh, environment, including climate, um, as long as it doesn't hurt price stability. And I think uh, that there is a lot that the ECB can do, uh, both with the Teltro, uh, with the asset purchase program, which will not uh, um, uh, be a, a danger to price stability. I think it will actually help uh, price stability. So in that sense, uh, I would say it's in the treaty, so you, they, they can do this. The, the problem, of course, is that there is this um, uh, time inconsistency in uh, government policy. And so the governments, they have signed up for uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, which sets goals for 2030, 2050. Um, and at the same time, currently, the, the policies, for instance, on carbon taxation, are not in line with that. Um, has so, so, so everybody expects that in the coming uh, uh, years, uh, a lot of extra policies will be implemented. Um, but the problem with the ECB policies is that they currently uh, st stimulate new lending. Uh, and they, so they do this under the old policies, so to say. Um, and, and I think that, that gives it an extra responsibility to, to look ahead. Um, and to say like, okay, so we, we, we need to make sure that the kind of like lending that we're uh, incentivizing now uh, is uh, not only sustainable now, but will be sustainable in five or 10 years uh, time as well. Um, and then, uh, Wojciech, can I ask my two questions to my fellow uh, presenters now as well? Yes. Um, so my, my, my first one um, uh, would be to, to, to Jezebel. Um, I, I said in our, our, our report, the new unconventional, uh, we, we, we also looked at this monetary fiscal coordination, uh, but we were very much looking at uh, what can you do within the current uh, treaty. Uh, and that's why we came up with this idea that the European Investment Bank or the European Commission, as has happened now with the, uh, the recovery fund, that they should issue new bonds. Um, and that the ECB should uh, have more implicitly than explicitly say, well, we back these bonds uh, and therefore make this, uh, this, this financing possible. Um, and and, and I, I think that's something that can be done. I mean, we see it, it, it is being done uh, within the current uh, treaty, but I understand you that you want to actually make a treaty change to make it even more direct and explicit uh, monetary finance. Um, so I, I, I would like to hear you about this this route that is being taken now with the European Commission and why you think that that, that would not be enough. Um, my, my question to Maria uh, would be, um, uh, you go for a uh, uh, total exclusion, as I understand, uh, for the uh, carbon intensive companies, which I, uh, uh, I, I know from my discussions with central bankers that they say, well, the problem with that is first of all that uh, uh, it, 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 this will uh, indeed be a problem for price stability because it will hamper the transmission mechanism. We cannot buy the large companies, uh, all the large companies in, uh, in Europe. Um, and it's actually for that reason that, uh, that Dirk Schoenmaker, uh, professor from Erasmus University said like, well, you should, should more choose for a tilting approach where you buy a bit more of the, the greenest and a bit less of, the, of the, 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 the carbon intensive, but you keep all of them. But, but so, so how do you look at that, uh, that uh, possibility? Um, but with that, um, uh, what I find difficult is that um, uh, if you think about the transition, um, uh, don't we also need some of those uh, intensive uh, companies? And so for instance, car manufacturers, they are carbon intensive in many ways, uh, but, but we, we, we don't think we can do without any uh, car manufacturers in the future. And so we need to have the, the ones that really go into the transition, uh, like Tesla in the US and like uh, maybe Volkswagen is trying to do now. And so 
in, in, in that sense, I would also there think it's more interesting maybe for the central bank and also in the end more effective for the transition to uh, choose within those carbon intensive sectors, the companies that, that make the transition and the ones that do not. Um, so, um, thank you. Maria. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, and uh, I can start with the question that Ren made and because it's a little bit linked with uh, some of uh, the questions that other participants have in the chat, um, which has to do with the transition risks. So uh, first of all, in uh, the scenarios that I uh, presented, in uh, the first scenario that I uh, presented, uh, we uh, keep uh, the uh, carbon intensive sectors uh, in our scenario that issue a green bond or they have a relatively low emission intensity. So um, I agree with the point that um, it doesn't make sense actually to uh, exclude all of uh, the positive comments because actually they might be the ones that can help to have this transition to low carbon economy. But what we say is that they need to be in line uh, with uh, what the uh, Paris Agreement has said. And in order to identify if they have done that or not, we say at least issue a, a green bond. So if you have something like with renewable energy and so on, uh, like uh, something like uh, other, like Tesla does, you need to prove it on the ways that you can prove it on the existing ways that uh, we have. So we take this into account and uh, we uh, agree with this uh, type of argument, but of course we have also this alternate scenario, the last one in which we exclude all of uh, the uh, carbon intensive sectors. And um, the chat box, uh, many of the uh, participants actually are a little bit uh, worried also about this issue and about the uh, transition risk. So uh, in our analysis and the existing scenarios uh, that we have analyzed, we focus only on this uh, greenness and deathiness. Uh, of uh, the firms of uh, the companies. But someone could say that we need to take into account the transition risk uh, as well. Uh, so as I said, uh, towards the end of the presentation, these are some of the alternative scenarios uh, that we present, uh, we uh, have done so far. Uh, we are uh, working on this, and actually in uh, the uh, project that we have on the collateral framework, um, we have some alternative scenarios in which we take into account transition risk. So we take into account that uh, in the future, the uh, next uh, years, uh, the uh, default or uh, rate of uh, the firms and what will happen. And we uh, adjust accordingly uh, the haircuts and uh, the way that we uh, exclude uh, bonds uh, from our scenarios. So I would say that not only the greenness and deafness, so uh, this, uh, not only the economic approach, let's say is important, the promotional approach, but also uh, the uh, risk-based uh, based approach. So we need uh, to uh, take this uh, into account. Um, then uh, I think the other question uh, was about these environmental risks. So as I said, we take into account this uh, low, relatively low emission intensity. Uh, but I agree with the point that why do we take uh, this into account? Or don't we have any other uh, ways to uh, measure other environmental risks? Um, and of course, uh, waste is uh, recycling uh, and other issues uh, are important as well. Uh, data are not very uh, good, uh, but Tom's uh, Reuters have some data for the waste per revenue. Uh, so as you might know, we have these ESG indicators uh, that various providers uh, give. Uh, the E part of this uh, ESG, it gives us some uh, detailed data and some of them, not only about the CO2, uh, about the emission intensity, they also give some data for uh, waste or renewable energy and cycling. So this is something that could uh, be uh, taken into account. So thanks for this. Yes, th thank you. Thank you to, to, to three of you. Now uh, there is, I will, we, we still have some four, four minutes so i'll just uh, add upon uh, our discussion a question about uh, what is uh, about the green taxonomy what, what could uh, that uh, could that be helpful in what context and uh, and maybe a question to my question to the three three of you is then do you think that your proposals uh, you know contribute to a transition that is fast enough because because especially rents pointed out some difficulties in and uh, the, he has strong points about uh, feasibility. But uh, for instance, is changing the financial financing conditions is it uh, 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 fast enough to to from the point of view of what should be done of the for, for the transition for the green transition and the climate change? So that is a very general question. Uh, and then Jezebel had also a question from 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 Rents. Uh, 
So Jezabel, but very shortly, please, uh, some two minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I agree with you, Rens. Uh, we need to, to start with uh, light green options. And, uh, um, and maybe after uh, we, um, uh, we, we could go for further, but um, I, um, I, I think that a, a treaty change uh, should no longer be a taboo subject because I'm not sure that uh, uh, we uh, uh, we will can achieve uh, the ecological transition uh, and we will can accelerate uh, the ecological uh, uh, transition with uh, the, the, the current uh, institutional frameworks. So uh, I think we, we need uh, changing uh, the uh, institutional uh, uh, frameworks. Um, um, Article one, two, three, uh, which uh, 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 which prevents as uh, the, the direct financing of states by the central banks uh, will be uh, uh, should be modified as a priority. I think it's very very difficult, but uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, it it will be a, a necessary perspective to uh, to accelerate the the, the transition. And um, um, I, I, I think too that uh, monetization will facilitate uh, the coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, the coordination is uh, uh, is not so easy uh, in the uh, in the current uh, institutional uh, uh, framework. Um, fiscal policy uh, uh, will be deeper um, with. Uh, 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 if if it uh, if it will uh, uh, mixed with uh, uh, a part of monetization in the monetary policy. Thank you, Isabel. So the, so Renz and Maria, I give you a, each one a, a short last word. Uh, uh, you can answer either to one of the questions that you see in the chats or or uh, or to my question, which was do you do do you do you think that uh, with your proposals we are moving uh, fast enough? Shall I start? Um, uh, so, so I um, uh, one thing I want to 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 emphasize, um, uh, and I, I know the the, the energy transition um, it 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 it's a huge task, so to say, for society. But we should also not make it too big. Um, has so the calculations done on what it costs, and if we see how much it costs at the moment, um, it's not like uh, like like it, it's one, two, three percent of GDP uh, that we need to invest uh, annually, which is a lot of money. Uh, but it's definitely also not something that we cannot uh, uh, achieve, even without um, uh, monetary policy to support it, if, if uh, politicians, uh, fiscal authorities really want it. And so I think that's, that's my, my, my answer to, to your question, Borstek, is that uh, primarily it, it is up to politicians. Um, and, 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 and if they don't act, then uh, central bankers will never be able, whatever they do, uh, to, to make this happen, even if, if, if we have the treaty change uh, that, that, that Jezebel is uh, proposing, uh, as long as the, the, the politicians are not moving, uh, you cannot do much as a central bank. Well, having said that, um, uh, you, whenever you look at the history of central banking, you see that at, at, at many different moments uh, all over the world, when society needed to make this large transition, uh, central banks have stepped in, um, and, 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 and in that reason, I think it, it would be logical for, for in Europe now the ECB to do that. Um, but most importantly, I think uh, within the current mandate, uh, they have enough room to do this. Um, and that's why I think the current discussion uh, with the strategy review of the ECB is so important, because for me, the big question is, are they going to take uh, the room there? Um, and, and, and well, they, they are looking at the politicians, the politicians are looking at them, uh, and, and, and I think they, they both need to, uh, to move, uh, but with the Green Deal and the European Commission, I, 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 I'm, I'm in a sense hopeful that, uh, that things will accelerate from, uh, from that side, and then monetary policy can, uh, can follow suit. Great to, to, to end with a positive note. Maria, uh, the last word is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Boris. So I would like to start whether uh, this uh, type of policy that we suggest is uh, fast enough in order to achieve the decarbonization. Um, first of all, I, I want to clarify that this is what we want to investigate. So what would be the impact if you have this type of alternative scenarios on the emissions? But overall, I would say that we don't expect huge changes 
uh, so that the ECB3 program could uh, actually achieve uh, fast uh, this decarbonization. And uh, we analyzed this in another paper uh, we have on QE. And actually, other monetary policies cannot have a substantial effect uh, to reduce uh, a lot of CO2 emissions. Uh, and uh, what I've said uh, in, uh, at my talk at the end is that actually fiscal policies are needed uh, in order to, uh, to actually have uh, this uh, transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, but um, I would like uh, just to uh, clarify that in any case, you need monetary policies to become greener because otherwise, if you have like the government making uh, some steps towards the right direction, then you have like monetary policies uh, that are not in line with this uh, two degrees uh, target. So that's a problem. So you need what uh, is, is a kind of coordination of these uh, different policies. Uh, but the EU taxonomy, just to mention uh, broadly, very broadly, uh, that we use it in our analysis, but of course, we need a lot of uh, work uh, yeah, for, to identify this potentially green sector. And I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. So there's the, the, some food for thought. Uh, thank you for to all three of you. Thank you to, for to the or, all organizers and tech, technical people who allowed this uh, workshop to take place. I hope that the you know people who listen to us they have some more clear ideas about uh, where this is going. And uh, definitely, this is a very uh, very acute uh, topic and uh, follow up what uh, the ECB and other other central banks are doing in this. In, in the European context, I think that we will have some first responses in the very next months. So, and then we will see whether it is uh, uh, sufficient or not for, for, to, to drive the transition, transition forwards. So thank you, thank you to the three of you once more. And uh, you have uh, some uh, 10 minutes before the next uh, session, which is, I think, a plenary session. So take a small coffee break, uh, home, wherever you are, and uh, join up to the plenary session. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you from, from Paris or whatever. Yeah, bye. Uh, yeah, thank you for this interesting session. I have the pleasure to make a few announcements now. My name is Magdalena. I work for Finanzwende, who is co-organizing this conference. And well, as uh, Wojtek already said, we now have a break. We continue at 4.45 with a keynote on central banking and climate change by Sylvie Goulard, who is second deputy governor of Banque de France. And this will be followed by a panel with uh, Daniela Gabor, Sabine Lautenschläger, Sylvie Goulard, and Frank van Lerven. And they ask, a new era of monetary financing, promotional versus prudential approaches. I posted all the details and log in details for the, con for the continuation in the chat. And now it, uh, I have the pleasure to invite you to our social conference tool, which replaces a bit the side talks that usually happen on conferences. You find the link in the chat as well. And there you... Uh, can get in touch with other participants just by clicking on the link and following the intuitive tool. And we will be happy to welcome you again in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank Goodbye. you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.